On December 9, 1965, near the village of Kecksburg, Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, witnesses describe an unusual object which fell from the sky into a wooded area. According to many accounts, within hours after the object had fallen, military equipment and personnel began to descend on this normally quiet rural community. Later that evening, a military flatbed tractor trailer truck was seen carrying an unusual shaped object away from the area. Some local residents claim that nothing fell from the sky that day, that the story is only a hoax. What is clear is that many witnesses tell similar accounts about what they experienced on that December day in 1965. Hello, my name is Stan Gordon. In 1959, I began an interest in reports of UFO sightings and the unexplained. Since that time, I have investigated thousands of UFO sightings and other unusual occurrences from across Pennsylvania. When I was 16, an event occurred not far from my hometown of Greensburg, Pennsylvania that created both local and national interest, the incident upon which this presentation is focused. This documentary will provide an avenue expression for some of those involved with the Kecksburg event so they may share their story. We will focus on the local activity associated with the case as related by area residents as well as persons from the news media, law enforcement and medical community who will share their experiences associated with the case. This documentary includes eyewitness testimony, some of which being revealed for the first time. Late on the afternoon of December 9, 1965, numerous witnesses from Canada and the Northeast United States observed a brilliant fireball moving rapidly across the sky. Sightings of a fireball reported over the Pittsburgh and Greensburg, Pennsylvania area as well. The object made a turn between Greensburg and Latrobe and was reported from local communities as it moved towards the south. Near Laurelville, the object turned again and began to track northeast towards the Kecksburg area where it reportedly impacted into the woods. Those who saw the object passing through the sky shortly before it fell believed that what they saw was not a meteor. Near Norvell, two young boys were playing outside when their attention was attracted upwards by an unusual sound. One of these boys was Randy Overly, who recalls what he saw that Thursday afternoon. I was approximately 10 years old. I was playing with another friend of mine out in the middle of an open field by a creek. And uh, I heard a noise and looked to the, I believe it was northwest, and uh, we saw an object coming at us. We could see it a pretty good distance away. We watched it come, fly over top of us, and leave our vision. Um, the object was sort of acorn-shaped. It had a raised area around the back. It was a brownish, grayish color. There was fire coming out of the back of it. It had a rounded part on the very tip of it. It also seemed to be covered with some type of vapor wrapped around it as it flew over. It made a hissing noise. Uh, it was probably only 200 feet in the air when we saw it, and we saw it for a you know, for a good distance coming at us. It had a reddish, yellowish flame, and it also had gr a greenish color in the flames. When it passed over us, it was probably only 200 feet in the air at the most, and it was moving no faster than a small aircraft. Uh, in fact, we saw it from a good piece away, probably a couple miles away and we're able to watch it approach us, fly over us, and fly away from us. So it wasn't moving very fast at all. Well, I know what I saw, and it definitely wasn't a meteor. I really can't explain what it, is, what it was, but it certainly seemed to be a constructed thing. You know, it, it uh, had smooth edges and smooth lines, and didn't appear to be a meteor at all to me. Bill Bullybush was working outside on the CB radio in his car when he saw the object. I was out here working on my Corvair. I was putting a, 
uh, CB radio in it. Well, it was in it, but I was trying to get more par out of it, see where I could go with it and who I could get with it. And I happened to look up in the air, and I, I was down down under the, like the dash, and I could see this. I was looking up, and I seen this blue, like a bluish fireball or whatever you call it, up in the sky coming from Norvelt and going towards Lorville, towards the mountain. And uh, I thought, uh-oh. So I went out on the road and I watched it. You could see it. And it just seemed like if it uh, wanted to go over the mountain and it couldn't go over the mountain. It just seemed like it hesitated. And then finally it came back and made a U-turn and went down into Kecksburg. Other witnesses saw the object ascend as well. After it fell, a blue column of smoke was seen rising from the area, but it quickly dissipated. It was at WHJB Radio in Greensburg, the county's first commercial radio station, where the station's news and office staff was overwhelmed with phone calls from residents who reported seeing the brilliant object. The late John Murphy was the news director of WHJB Radio at the time of the incident. As the story broke, he began to document the information. The control tower at the Greater Pittsburgh Airport definitely confirmed the fact that there was an object in the sky at that time, 13 minutes before 5. Mabel Mazza, former office manager of WHJB Radio, recalls the event of that day. I, I was employed at WHJB Radio in Greensburg. At this particular time, um, I was in the capacity of bookkeeper and office manager. Um, for some reason or other, I stayed over that evening um, at the radio station and there was a number of calls started to come in at about 5, 5.30, somewhere around there, concerning a sighting of a saucer or a UFO or some kind of an unidentified object in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. Um, as time went on, the calls became more frequent and more steady. We received a lot of calls from uh, a number of radio stations and TV stations. Uh, of course, at first I thought, you know, these are just a bunch of people, you know, playing pranks. Well, as the uh, evening went on, I realized something definitely had or did happen. And um, they were serious and they were excited and there was full of emotion. After 6.30 p.m., the radio station received a call that earlier something had fallen from the sky into the nearby Kecksburg woods. John Murphy notified the state police at Greensburg, then drove to the Kecksburg site. He was at the scene at about 7.20 p.m. and was there for almost an hour when Carl Metz, the state police fire marshal, and another investigator arrived along with a group of other people. Metz and the investigator went down into the woods with a Geiger counter and a flashlight. When they returned, Murphy approached the pair to find out what they had found. I asked Carl, did you find anything down there? He looked puzzled for a second and said, I'm not sure. Then I said, well, let me ask my question a different way. After you make your report to the captain, do you think you or the captain perhaps may have something to tell me? And he said, you better get your information from the Army. Now this was the first time that the name uh, Army was brought into the conversation. This was the first time anyone had made any mention of the military. Afterwards, Murphy went to the Greensburg State Police Barracks where he saw Army and Air Force personnel. Soon he joined a small group of police and military who were returning to the Kecksburg site. Upon arrival, Murphy was denied entrance into the woods. You know that some of the calls, whenever I was taking those, uh, as I say, uh, after about six o'clock or so, they started to reach outlying areas. And I was getting calls from TV stations and um, radio stations all over the United States. And then I started to get these calls from the military and the Air Force. I remember specifically Air, the Air Force and the Pentagon. And I thought, oh, somebody's playing a crank. You know, why would the Pentagon call here about something like this? During the hours following the object's impact, various activities reported to have taken place in different locations around Kecksburg. Firemen began a search for what was initially thought to have been an airplane which had exploded in the sky which may have crashed. 
The military reportedly began to arrive, and as word spread about the crash, more and more people began to arrive in the area, including news media representatives from area newspapers and TV and radio stations. Bob Gaddy is a professional writer who in 1965 worked as a general assignment reporter for the Greensburg, Pennsylvania Tribune Review. He was assigned to the Kecksburg story when it occurred. I thought we'd get out there and, you know, there wouldn't be anything. But there was a big crowd of people. We worked our way up to the, uh, to a cordoned off area where there were a lot of state police and, and some people in military uniform. I don't recall how many military types, nor do I recall whether they were Army, Air Force, Marines, what, what have you. But I distinctly remember seeing some military types. And I wondered at the time, why, you know? Why are there military people here? Uh, but we couldn't get any answers. Uh, they wouldn't let us pass the cordoned off area because my recollection is that the bottom line was that, that the Department of Defense didn't want anybody in there because whatever came down might be radioactive and therefore harmful. I think something was down there and that's why they wouldn't let anybody get, go in the area. That's what I think. I think something landed there. I'm not so sure at the time that the authorities were really sure what it was. Because if you, if you think about it, how would they really know unless they tracked it on radar, which is entirely possible, I guess. Um, but uh, they may have felt that there was some danger. And of course, if there was a national security issue, they wouldn't let anybody down. I've never been restricted from having access like I was having. I've been on, I've been on uh, uh, some accident scenes where things were so gruesome that they tried to keep you away from it just because they didn't want you bothering the family and things like that, which is understandable, but this seemed far, far more restricted than that. Really. I mean, it was almost as though you go in there, buddy, and you're going to get your head bashed up. Like I walked up to the, I remember walking up to, I don't know, I guess the state cop said, I want to go down there. I said, no, you can't go down there. I said, why not? I said, well, you don't know what might be down there. I said, that's why I want to go down there, to find out. And they said, well, you can't. I said, well, what if I do? You'll be arrested. So I guess that was direct enough. Ernie Hoffman was the general silent reporter for the Tribune Review, who replaced Bob Gaddy later that evening. We drove to a place near the village of Kecksburg, a, uh, just a nondescript rural area. I was a little, uh, I remember it being a narrow, typical country road. I believe there was a fence on the side. There were a lot of people there. I, you wouldn't uh, get this, this amount of people uh, out in the middle of the country for just uh, to look at the moon or what have you, on a winter night or early, early winter, late uh, fall, I guess it was. So we pulled off along the shoulder, and uh, what I remember seeing was across a field, maybe 100 yards away near a tree line, a what appeared to be a military tractor trailer, flatbed tractor trailer, moving out of the tree line. And on the back, there was something under a tarpaulin, something that couldn't be seen. It wasn't particularly large, though, probably, uh, oh, I don't know, the size of a couple of suitcases, maybe something of that nature. Um, but it was difficult to see it. Then I recall the next day when I uh, read Bob Gaddy's story with the official explanation that it had been a meteor the people had seen in the sky, but it, the meteor hadn't landed there. It landed somewhere else, if it landed at all. Uh, I was really disappointed by that explanation because there was just too much activity down there, uh, too much of a reaction to this report of a UFO for it to be nothing at all. There had to be something, I thought. The next day, the Tribune Review carried several articles about the incident. Gaddy reported, no one is being allowed near the object. State police officials there, he said, ordered the area roped off to await the expected arrival of both U.S. Army engineers and possibly civilian scientists. 
On the same day, Captain Joseph Dusha, commanding officer of Troop A of the Pennsylvania State Police, told the Tribune Review that the search uncovered absolutely nothing. The Air Force explained the sighting as a meteor. Many astronomers are convinced of this explanation as well. While official records only verify that three members of the Air Force were involved in the search, many witnesses describe a large number of military personnel in the area that night, including members of the Army. The late James Mays was the first assistant fire chief at Kecksburg in 1965. Jim stated that he had responded to the fire station awaiting additional firemen to assist in the search for reported downed aircraft. Mays and another fireman went with a state trooper to the top of a hill where he saw what he described as bright flashing time blue lights. Later when Mays returned to the fire station, he stated that the military was starting to arrive and they used the station as a command post. He estimated there were 20 to 25 military personnel in that area. When some of the military brass arrived on the scene, he and some other Kecksburg firemen drove these officers on their four-wheel drive fire vehicle through the fields to the area of the reported crash site. As they approached the woods, the firemen were told to stop and not to go any further. The military officers proceeded ahead on foot. Okay, when the military was calling me concerning uh, this UFO sighting at Kicksburg, um, they were asking me directions, they were asking me where it was, etc and I was giving them specific directions from Pittsburgh because they evidently they were flying in, I don't know, but uh, they were coming in from Washington, D.C., and they needed specific directions. So I did give them directions, and I also gave them uh, the telephone number of the radio station that if they got halfway out there, they could um, call me again. The military equipment and personnel, having arrived in the small village, created a scene that Robert Blystone says he would never forget. A little later on that evening, I decided to take a walk into Kecksburg, and uh, you could see military everywhere. I mean, no matter where you looked at, there was military on the corners, up and down the roads. Uh, and then if I took a walk a little further down from the store where I was standing, you could see right down to the uh, um, fire hall. And uh, you could see the military vehicle sitting down there. You could tell they were military uh, because of the, I don't know, like an off-green uniform. Uh, they had helmets on their heads. Uh, as in for Kecksburg by the, the store and up the road and down the road a little bit, um, I'd say maybe there was 10, 12 of them standing there. They. Uh, they were armed with uh, rifle, sidearm. And as for me, a kid about 15, 16 years old, I mean, that was pretty exciting, you know, to see all the military there, all the vehicles. And that's something you don't really uh, forget too easily. And as for those people that did say that there was nothing there, I don't know why they're saying it, because it, it happened, it actually happened. Larry Snyder was sitting with a couple of friends at a drive-in restaurant near Norvelt when someone came in and told them of the reported landing. We were in the restaurant and there was someone came in and I don't remember who it was at that time because you know, that, you know, that there was a craft or a meteor that landed over in uh, Kecksburg. So there was three of us got in a vehicle and we uh, drove over to the site and uh, we didn't really know that there were military or anything there at that time. What we, you know, what we were back then were just curious teenagers. So uh, we attempted to uh, get into the site, and we know more and got out of the car and walked down through the field. We didn't get very far, and there were, there was, uh, at the point where we tried to get in there, there was one armed uh, military there that said that we were not allowed in, and we asked them why not. And uh, he said there was a meteor that landed. Well, I, I didn't, back then, I didn't even think twice, you know, to, for the uh, fact that there could have been something other than a meteorite. So what we did, we took from the one site where we were, I mean, from the one part of the road where we tried to get in, we walked down around the field, and we tried to get in another area where there was a, a place to, you know, where we thought we could get in to see the, the, uh, craft that landed there, and uh, well, 
I say craft, but at this point, but I, but I never got in. So we tried to get in there, but there was another armed military down in there, and they would not leave us in. So we just turned around and, and we left. I would have to say that the uh, military that we saw there, the, he was well. They were calm about uh, the fact, you know, that we were there. That. I couldn't see any uh, hysteria or anything of that nature. They, they showed authority that, uh, that they didn't want us in the area and told us to leave. There was no pushing or anything at that point in time whenever I was there. They just told us to leave and we just did that. We just got in the car and left. Linda Fosha lived on the Greensburg Mount Pleasant Road in 1965. She describes what she observed that evening. I lived out on the Greensburg Mount Pleasant Road, which was heading in towards Kecksburg, if you kept following it. I was walking my baby, a crying baby, at the picture window when we see all the activity that goes on, traffic up and down uh, the Greensburg Mount Pleasant Road. My husband had listened to the radio and heard that there was a fallen object and we were watching the uh, traffic back and forth because there was a lot of um, police cars and there was just a lot of traffic up and down the road and we did see after an hour and a half or so a convoy and there was a flatbed truck and just a typical convoy like you would see on the road where they're going to camp with uh, quite a few army trucks. Robert Bittner, a Kecksburg fireman at the time of the incident, arrived in the vicinity of the impact site later that evening after returning from work. Bittner recalls what he saw. Went back to an old farmhouse on the end of the lane, and our truck was there, and several other firemen were there with it. Well, we, we gathered around there, and they talked about different things there for a while and finally here comes a, a military truck in the same lane that I had just come in. It was a personnel carrier and a six by six army truck with a canopy on the back. So they stopped at our truck and they said they were, they were going down into this ravine. Well, a couple of us asked, uh, I don't know the officer's uh, rank or nothing, but he was, he was a highly ranked officer of, from the, I don't even know if it was the Air Force or the Army, but he was from the military. So we asked him if we could go down there with him, and he said no. He said nobody's going down there with us. They took the 6 to 6 down. And they must have stayed down there, I'd say approximately a half hour. And then they came back up out of there. And they stopped in the same place. They had, I don't know how many men was there with the truck, with the military. But they asked, they told us that they were done with our trucks, so that we could take it back to the station. So we took our truck there, which I didn't go back to the station there. I lived up near this area, and so I went on home. And the military left. They took that 6 to 6 truck out of there. On the evening of the occurrence, hundreds of people jammed the winding road that bordered the wooded area where the object reportedly fell. What the crowd didn't know that night was that the object had reportedly fallen on the opposite side of the woods from where they were located. Most of the military activity was occurring in the distant fields and on a lane also on the opposite side of the woods. While some witnesses claim that the military reportedly used the Kecksburg Fire Station as a temporary command post, other witnesses closer to the impact area described the military using their farmhouse. The Hayes family had recently rented the house and had been in there for only a short time when the incident occurred. Members of the family recall military and other personnel around their home. We first was aware of this. My husband was in the living room listening to the radio. And uh, he 
heard the announcement there was a fireball fell in Acme. So he came out and he told me, and we went outside and we're looking up towards Acme to see any smoke or whatever, and there was nothing. So we come back in the house and he's listening, and there was reports again, and uh, I was in the living room with him, and when I walked out in the kitchen, I happened to glance out the window to the road behind the house, and uh, I started laughing. I said, that isn't in Acme, it's right here in our backyard. So he come out, and then we walked out along the garden, seeing what we could see, and we heard a lot of people talk, and we seen the cars. And there was a smell that night, like sulfur. And uh, he was saying maybe it's the furnace. So we didn't pay too much attention. We went back in the house and we was there for a while and he walked out. My husband went out and he was checking around. And the first thing he came in, he had, I'm pretty sure, but not positive that it was state cops that come in first and wanted to use the phone. And when they went out, he was out a little bit, and then the military. He bring the military in, and he told me they want to use the phone. At one point when he came in, he says that uh, they're calling in NASA. So uh, then there, we had uh, military in there off and on all evening, some in uniforms some in plain clothes, but there was important people. You could just tell by their way they acted. And mostly just seen groups talking among themselves, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. But they used a phone quite a bit that evening, and there was never no phone calls on my bill where they went to. Yeah, some other people that was in the house kept coming in at different times, and they would sort of meet in there, and they was talking in groups. There was, I know one is a sort of tall guy. He had uh, a beret on, and it seemed to me that it was a dark blue uniform on. He was military. There was no doubts about that. And then there was a lot of uh, ones that didn't, was in civilian clothes. One in particular was a short one, heavy set with a jacket on, and I don't remember what kind of pants he had on. It's too long ago. <laughs> I just went to bed and heard a knock on the door. So I went downstairs to see what was going on and found out that there was some military people there. And. Uh, when they seen me, they asked my dad to send me back to bed. And before that, I had already seen all cars and stuff lined up again on the on the roads and on the driveway because we got windows all around the house. And my bedroom window faced everything that was going on. Uh, our bathroom was downstairs, so I made quite a few trips to the bathroom that night just to see what was going on down there. I seen seen people in, uh, well, at the time I didn't know, you know, their their rank or their, their uh, service. But since then I've been in service myself, so I know some of them was Air Force and some of them was Army, just by the uniforms they was wearing. And uh, I seen him on the phone. I did hear one time when uh, I was downstairs that NASA was on their way. And it was right after, it was not long after that, I heard a knock on the door. I looked out the window above where the door was at. And I seen, seen some men standing in uh, white coverall type suits and the one had a NASA patch on it. And right after that, everybody left. And I went back upstairs and was watching out my window. I seen trucks and flashlights and 
Every, all kind of things going on, people running around. There was cars and trucks all along the highway, or all along the driveway. In fact, they was all along the highway on the other side of the hill, too. Um, but I seen a truck come from the driveway. It went down through the gully in the field, went right down the hollow. The field where they went down through, there was a gate there, but it's always wet right there. So they went straight down the hollow. So they cut the fence in the hollow, went down straight in the hollow. Once you get down in a little bit, you can't really see nothing from the house. You can see lights and stuff. They had everything lit up. I seen a truck going down in, a flatbed going down in, and it went down in empty, it come out with something on the back of it about the size of a Volkswagen. Next day I got up, we decided we was gonna go down and check things out. There, I went over and the fence was down. I had to put the fence back up because we had cows down in there. I went, me and my brother walked down through the woods, sneaked down through the woods, and we could see where somebody had covered up an area that was in a in a little dry wash. We could see treetops busted off and trees busted down. We went on down over the hill and over onto the other side. And when we got on the other side, we seen seen a guy over there. He had uh, looked like a treasure finder, one of those little hand things, you know, to walk around with. And uh, he chased us out of the woods. He told us there was a chance of radiation over there. I was 10 years old at the time. And I'll tell you what, to me it was exciting. I mean, I'd seen all these here military people running around. I'd seen all these people outside running around. I'd seen all these cars and trucks. And it's coming over the radio, it's UFO that crashed. and. It was exciting to me, you know. It, a little kid ain't gonna forget something like that. Bill Bullybush from nearby Mammoth saw the object descend towards Kecksburg. He quickly drove to the highest point overlooking the area, and he saw what looked like blue sparklers down in the woods below. He may well have been the first person to see the unusual acorn-shaped object on the ground. I know that place up there. Uh, I went up the back road, so it's oh you overlook Kecksburg. You can see, I mean, you're way up, and I hunted up there a lot. I, I I understood the place, so it was just about dark. So I grabbed my flashlight and I started down over the hill, down in the ravine and across the creek, and and I looked up and it was in the patch of woods, and I could see it just looked like a bunch of kids playing with sparklers and it blue flame and and. Uh, I could, the closer I got to it, I could hear this sizzling noise, you know, and I, it just seemed like something was, like uh, you put a piece of steel in a bucket and it, it was cooling off, you know, and uh, I went up and tried to get closer and closer and closer, and <laughs> I got kind of scared of it, you know, so I had the flashlight on it, and I could see it, and it just, it looked like a, like my can up there, burnt orange. And uh, it was still arcing, blue flames and coming out of it, and it's still sizzling. And uh, it was embedded in, in the ground a little bit, where it come down and, and like belly landed. And uh, I looked at it, and you could see uh, it had a ring around the back end of it, and it had uh, some kind of Egyptian marking on it or something. It looked like backward writing on it. I could see where the trees was all bent one way where it come in. But uh, it just seemed like it, it came in like an airplane. It, it seemed like it was controlled. It, it came in real just like a, a just glided right in and embedded itself right into the bank. And, uh, you know, like I said, it, it, it was all sealed. You couldn't see nothing. But uh, what, I mean, if it had been anything else, it had come straight down and made a big hole in the ground. But this thing, when it came in, it just came in and, and glided right into the bank and embedded its front end in it, and that was the end of it. 
Through the course of the afternoon and evening, others also reported blue light sources from that area. It was later learned that some boys were running around the area flashing off a camera strobe after hearing about the events at Kecksburg. It is likely that some of the lights reported were associated with that hoax. Jim Romansky was not from Kecksburg, but states that his involvement with the incident was a result of his being a member of an area volunteer fire department that was called out to assist in a search for a possible downed aircraft. We're going through the fields and the woods and everything with flashlights and that spread out 20, 30 yards apart. And we're searching for any signs of some type of crash or impact area. And over the walkie-talkie, we heard another team calling in that they had found the impact area, and they were telling where it was and everything. And we realized it wasn't no more than a couple hundred yards down in front of us in the woods. So abandoning in our search area, the whole team, which comprised, if I can remember correctly, I think it was five guys, we ran down through the woods, got down there, and here, to our surprise, was the other team. And the impact area. We didn't discover a conventional aircraft as we know it. What we did find was a very large metallic object. There was no signs of entry in it. There was no signs of windows, portholes, doors. Uh, there was no signs of wings. There was no signs of a tail assembly. Uh, there was no sign of motors of any type one to another. And it caught us totally by surprise. Because here I was expecting to see this aircraft or a smashed up aircraft in these uh, woods where we uh, were at. And lo and behold, this was not the uh, thing that we expected. Now the object itself was entirely made of metal. I did not see no seams or rivet marks where this thing was put together. I see no signs of getting into this object. And the front of it, or what I presume was the front of it, was pushed down into what I thought at the time was a complete, um, like it smashed into the ground and plowed itself in. So how much of it was buried down and under the ground or the brush and the leaves and everything that it was there, uh, I don't know. Now, the part that I did see was probably, oh, 10, 12, 15 feet long and maybe, I don't know, 8, 9, 10, 12 foot in diameter. I know from what I seen it was out of the ground and in this gully it was in or whatever it was, that a grown man, if he was standing up inside it, would have had no problem at all moving inside of it. The very unique thing about the object, there was no signs whatsoever of any type of propulsion unit on it. I have described this object in shape as a huge acorn because it had a sloped side to it and then it came back and it was uh, lifted up a little bit in the back like it was a bumper going the whole way around it, and then it dropped down and came straight down the back. But on this bumper was these geometrical and all kind of designs. Uh, I have used the terminology, it reminded me of the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Whether or not that was an exact uh, description, I don't know. There was lines, there was uh, zigzag lines and stars and circles and all kind of various different little shapes. But like I said, it looked like someone took a welding rod and just welded a bead for in some type of different designs. The bumper itself was uh, had radiuses coming off of the surface of the object, came up, went around, and again, another radius and back to the surface of the object. To me, it resembled like somebody cast this out of metal. I mean, there was, you couldn't see a, a seam, a break, nothing in it, even where the bumper was. This is just one big shape of metal, and then the back was perfectly smooth. I, like I said, I didn't see no doors, no windows, no portholes, no engines, no nothing. There was nothing sticking out. There was no cracks, no rivets, no weld seams, nothing. This is why I use the word impact area. 
because to me, right away, I thought, uh-oh, I know that we were in outer space at the time. Maybe one of these big satellites or something we shot up came down. But also in the same token, looking at these writings or hieroglyphics, whatever they were, were nothing I've ever seen. About 15 minutes after Romanski arrived at the impact site, two men in overcoats came down through the woods. These two guys came down out of the woods, looked at us, and told us that uh, we had to get out of there because this was now a quarantined area and to get our butts out of there and leave. Well, being a volunteer fireman, our, we did our main objective. We got to the impact site. We did a preliminary search, couldn't find survivors or bodies or anything. We were being relieved by somebody, so we decided to get out of there. So we started leaving, and I know we hadn't gone no more than 20 feet from the object, and down through the woods, here comes a bunch of military people. I mean, there was no, no doubt in anybody's mind that these were military. They had full-blown uniforms on, carrying all kind of equipment and that. And we pa probably passed within five to six to seven feet of each other. Even with flashlights, you could t see, I mean, shined it right on them, they shined their lights on us. And you can see that they were military. How many there was, I don't know. I know I seen four or five, and there was more lights coming down through the woods. And I had no idea where they were coming from. Well, I was down there, I mean, just the day before that, because I was down there milking cows. I went down there. We hunted down there. We played down there. I knew the area real well. And I was down there just the day before. Like I said, I brought the cows out to be milked and trees and everything was still up then. And next day when I got down in, treetops had busted, trees knocked down. It wasn't erosion that did that. Bill Weaver was a teenager at the time, and he drove to the area after hearing on the radio that an object had landed. I was uh, out that evening, I was riding around in my car, I had a Red Olds convertible. I was listening to the radio, WHJB, and they come over and said that there was an object landed in Kecksburg. So I come upon some people standing along the road, and I pulled off onto a farm road. Went back there, and I seen some more other people standing. I parked my car, got out, I went over to those people. I looked down into a small ravine that was um, some scrub trees, that type of thing. Down in there, I could see there was something was down there, but I couldn't tell what it was. I could see there was a, a bright light coming from it. Uh, we stood around, we talked, I uh, went and got a spotlight out of my car. I was going to play that down in there to see if I could get a better idea of what it was. A fella come up out, out of the, uh, up through the field, I'll put it that way, up through the field and told me to put the spotlight away. Uh, used a commanding voice type of thing, such as maybe he was a policeman or whatever, but he was just dressed in street clothes. Uh, I put the light away at that point. A little while later, there was a large truck pulled in, a light-colored truck, a box van type. Out of it, there was four guys come out. They had what we called moon suits at the time. They were white coverall type suit. They took a box out of there, it was a box maybe four or five foot square. They carried down four handles, and they carried that down to the object. About just right after that, there was a military man come over to the car and he told us to leave. And I got into an argument with him. And told him I didn't, you know, I wanted to stay, I didn't want to leave. At that point he told me that he would confiscate my car if I didn't. So we then, myself and the other people, we pulled out, left, and they made sure we were out of the area and wouldn't let us back in. Weaver's description of the four men dressed in white protective suits carrying what appears to have been a specialized container towards a reported impact site raises some questions. Did these men have knowledge that there was something inside of the object that they wanted to recover? 
Jerry Betters, a well-known jazz musician in the Pittsburgh area, states that he also went to Kecksburg that evening after hearing about the incident on the radio. Betters claims that not only did he see numerous armed military personnel in the area that night, but for a short time he saw the acorn-shaped object uncovered on the back of an army flatbed truck. After I called my friend up and he's driving up there, he's like, like I'm crazy, okay, but I'll take you up there. So when I, we go up this dirt road, when I see these soldiers, I'm elated because I know what I heard had to be true because all these army people there, you know, I, I just felt happy because I, I knew, you know, what I heard it was true. And they were standing there with their guns and everything. Then out of the woods came this army truck, khaki color with a big white star on it, which had this UFO on the back of it. Then, I was so excited, you know, my heart was beating a mile a minute because I, I always believed in these things and to see it, you know, it was really something. That's when this guy, this officer came down, very nasty, he hollered, get these people out of here. And with these guys, they cocked their guns and they put them on us. And I was begging the people I was with, come on, let's park and pull over in the woods or something like that, I want to see this. But they, they were pretty nasty to us. They, they did have the, the guns pointed at us. There was an army truck, long flatbed on it. It was long enough to hold this thing, to set this thing on. And it, it was like, to me, it looked copperish looking. Maybe it was burn or something, but it was copperish looking. It, it was big. What I, was, what I would be expecting to see if I was going to see UFO would be a, just a very big, you know, flat circular thing. But this was different. It was domed and it had the fringe out. And I saw the hieroglyphics on it. Later in the evening, the crowds began to leave Kecksburg since they weren't able to get anywhere near the area where the object reportedly fell. Some people were given an explanation as to what was found. I can remember, you know, the, now you got to look at back, this is 30 years ago. I'd have been, uh, in 1965, I was 19 years old, and if, and if the military told you you weren't allowed in, there was, uh, none of us pressed the issue about going in. Uh, they just flat out told you, you know, that you're not allowed beyond this point, and they told us to clear out. And uh, I remember, at, uh, in, in fact, I'm the one that asked, I, I asked him the, uh, the second one that I saw, because I asked him what, uh, uh, you know, what crashed in the field, and he told me it was a meteorite. But back then, I, I didn't think twice about there being uh, armed military not leaving you in at a, uh, a meteorite site. And I had never given this one thought since that because back then I was living in Michigan and I was just back here for the, for the Christmas holidays to see my, uh, my parents. And I had never given this another thought for the last 30 years until I saw that there was going to be on, uh, on TV there was a show. And that's a, only the first time I had ever even thought about that since that, since that, uh, since that night, so. Mm -hmm. And once they said that it could have been something other than a meteorite, and that's what makes you think now, why would they need armed military there to guard a meteor? And this guy walks up, and we could hear him telling other people, you can leave, you can leave, you're just dismissed, and you're released, and all this, you know, and we couldn't wait, come on, come on, let's get out of here, we're freezing to death, you know. Guy comes up to us, okay, guy, you can leave, good job, blah, 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 blah. And like I said, I don't remember exactly if it was me or someone in my team says, well, what was it? But I'll never forget his answer. He looked at us, said it was a meteorite. Well, nobody questioned the guy, okay? We wanted to get out of there. Before we left, though, I can distinctly remember me and my senior first aid instructor, he looked at me, I looked at him, and I said, ain't no way that that was a meteorite. And he said, no, he said, you're right. Late that night, witnesses spotted a military flatbed truck coming from the direction of the reported impact site. I was standing by the Kecksburg store and down off of Snake Hill comes a uh, Jeep. And then right behind it was a military flatbed truck. 
with an object on it. And it was covered over with a uh, tarp. And the way it was covered and tied, you could tell and see a shape of whatever the object was. And the object was like a uh, acorn shape. And uh, behind it was like another military vehicle. I'm not exactly sure if it was a Jeep or a truck. And uh, they went down past the Pepsi plant. And if you got in their way, at the speed that they were going, you would never gotten out of the way. All of a sudden, down over this hill, here comes a Jeep with a red light on it. Here comes the flatbed truck. But this time on the back of that flatbed truck was a very large tarped object. And to me, I would say the size of the object on the back of the truck, even though it was covered with a tarp, was just about the size of the object that had been laying up in the impact area. Behind that tr flatbed truck was another Jeep with its light, red light on. Now they come down that road hell bent for leather. And I'll tell you what, I've used the expression that if anybody would have ever walked out on that road, they'd have scraped them up with a putty knife because they weren't stopping for nobody. The military convoy reportedly journeyed to what was then Lockbourne Air Force Base near Columbus, Ohio. After a short stayover, the object was transferred to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio. Myron was a truck driver working for a large Ohio supply house. A few days after the Kecksburg incident occurred, he was delivering special bricks to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. He was unloading the bricks when he saw something that changed his life, something he wasn't supposed to see. And we found the base, and they took us from the back side of the Wright Patterson Air Base all the way through the main part of the base, out the other side, down Maple Street, to the old rec uh, training center for World War II. When I walked in the facility, I seen the bell shape. It was uh, sitting there on stilts, and it had a great big parachute or something draped down over the top with a light up underneath the parachute trying to cover this thing up so no one could see it. And you could see a ladder leaning against the bell where they was trying to get in through one of the openings. And the guard said that you wasn't allowed to be in here, but now I've already seen everything in there. So it didn't bother me when he ran me back out. The spaceship looked like a, a large acorn. Runs about 14 feet to the top and about 10 to 12 feet wide at the bottom with a collar on it that has writing on the collar. And it had a triangle on it and it looked like the triangle was put on there with a welder by sticking the welder against the metal to shape the, the writing and the writing was all the way around the bell shape of it. And the black, the back, the bottom of the bell shape was completely black and around the top of the edges was was smoke covered and the space thing looked like it was copper or bronze. Uh, the brick that, that, that they was using was the same brick that the building was made out of and they was going to make it to look like that was a part of that building and no one would ever know the difference because if you look at the, build, the brick that they used was the same brick that the building was made out of. One to do with this brick is to enclose it. For many years later, no one would ever know what, what was in that corner of that building because it, the brick was the same brick that the building was made out of. They was going to entomb it. Another driver who worked for the same supply company also saw what he described as a Liberty Bell-shaped object covered with a tarpaulin on a flatbed trailer at the base the day before. During the time of the event, the Air Force was officially investigating UFO sighting reports under the name of Project Blue Book. This copy of the official Project Blue Book report on the incident lists the official explanation as a meteor. In the report it states that a further call was made to the Oakdale radar site in Pennsylvania. A three-man team has been dispatched to ACME PA to investigate and pick up an object at the start of the fire. The report also says that the search for the object continued until 2 a.m. that nothing was found. Witnesses state that they saw both Air Force and Army personnel at the site. 
Over the years, there has been some confusion over the fact that the Air Force report identifies ACME as the location of the incident rather than Kecksburg. It is likely that this is due to the fact that one of the witnesses which the Air Force had contact with had an ACME mailing address, which is only a short distance from a reported impact site at Kecksburg. Since both the Air Force report and various news sources verified that some members of the 662nd Radar Squadron from Oakdale were involved in the search for the object, I obtained the records of that unit for that period. While the report contains detailed information about the operations of that unit for that time period, it contains no mention of the incident. I have learned, however, that information of this nature may have not been entered into these reports, but may have been classified in records at a higher level. Research over the years leads us to consider the possibility that some facts about the Kecksburg case were hidden from the public. Dr. William Everett established his practice in ophthalmology in the Pittsburgh area in 1955. He was affiliated with the Ioneer Hospital of Pittsburgh. Dr. Everett has extensive credentials and is well known in his field. The incident and my involvement with the Kecksburg incident goes back to my relationship with Dr. Murray F. McCaslin, who was chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh and at the Ioneer Hospital. As I had stated earlier, I worked closely with Dr. McCaslin with the residency teaching program and became a confidant of his over the years. We hunted together, we fished together. He became a father figure and a true mentor to me. And we had a, quite a close relationship. One afternoon, we met as we usually did during the week to discuss the events that had occurred in the program and what matters needed attended to. And after we had pretty well uh, covered program matters, Mary took me aside and very confidentially and very seriously said, Bill, I want to tell you a story that you might find interesting. And he said, but you must never tell anybody under any circumstances about this story. And I said, fine. Mar Murray was a very highly regarded person uh, as chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology and had, without a question, one of the biggest surgical practices in western Pennsylvania and probably one of the larger surgical practices in the country at the time. He was a man who was considered with high regard and I really was quite puzzled at uh, what story he might have for me but he always had something interesting to say in our conversations. And he told me he had been called to Falk Clinic which is the outpatient department at that time of Ioneer Hospital down on Fifth Avenue and when he arrived there there were several officers, military officers, who had brought a young boy approximately age 17 as I could gather and Dr. McCaslin was asked to examine this young man. All he was told was that he had been burned uh, somewhere in the Kecksburg area. This involved his eyes only and they wanted his opinion as regards his eyes. Dr. McCaslin told me that when he viewed this individual with a microscopic uh, lamp we use, a slit lamp, that the corneas of both eyes were white and opaque. He had never seen anything as startling as this in his entire career. I might add that I have not either in my career. He was advised not to make any record of this uh, or any notes. Uh, he told them that he felt that the only thing that to be done was to observe this young man at the time. The military officers took the young man away. No record was made, no record was kept. Ron Asbury was the operations manager for WHAB Radio in Greensburg at the time of the occurrence. Yeah, I think, like I say, I left the radio station, again, I'm just guessing, somewhere between 7 and 8 o'clock. Uh, and, and I was pulling into my driveway, and again, I think it was around 9.30, 10 o'clock, I would imagine, when I heard the, uh, the ABC news report saying that a flying saucer uh, had, been, uh, had crashed in western Pennsylvania. And uh, 
uh, was being investigated and the person who was on the duty that night at KQV called me and wanted to know what was going on because he was getting reports from my news director, John Murphy, and he was just questioning the veracity of this person and I was telling him that, you know, John was, was reliable. And it was uh, then a little while later uh, in the evening that uh, the person who was on duty at KQV called me and again wanted to know what was going on because he had received a f telephone call from the headquarters in New York, ABC New York, telling them not to use the story anymore and to tell John Murphy not, not to call him. Um, and that seemed rather unusual because whatever it was, it was still a big story. All of the local radio stations and television stations had sent uh, representatives out there to investigate. And it seemed rather odd that, uh, that they would just want to stop the story right when it was at its, its peak. Scott Crane has been researching the UFO mystery for many years and is a state section director for the Mutual UFO Network. During his research, he came across some interesting information about the Kecksburg case. On May 30th, 1991, Dr. Armin Victorian, a researcher from Nottingham, England, called Dr. Eric Walker of State College, Pennsylvania. Dr. Walker was the executive secretary of the R&D board for the U.S. government back in the early 50s. He had certain security clearances and he even, it's been speculated that he had attended some meetings at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base involving crashed UFOs. Uh, Dr. Walker also served as the president of the Pennsylvania State University. Armand asked Dr. Walker if he could recall uh, an object coming down near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania in, in December of 1965. Dr. Walker reportedly responded that he not only remembered the incident, but he was summoned to the crash site accompanied by two military personnel. Uh, our men went on to say then, what, what did you find? And Dr. Walker simply said, and I quote, I cannot comment on that, I can't tell you. Now, if the object was a meteorite or an asteroid or some other kind of astronomical phenomena, there'd be no reason why Dr. Walker couldn't identify the object. Why was there a secret? If the probe was a terrestrial probe, that is from a foreign nation, and we, when we got there, the government got there and decided, well, we want to keep this. We'll call it a meteorite and take this back to our labs. Then that could be one explanation. However, if that happened, then they broke a United Nations agreement made in 1962, an international agreement, which stated that a foreign country's debris or space debris falls in your backyard, then you're to give it back to them. Another explanation it might be an extraterrestrial probe, that is, an object that came from someplace else. If that happened, then we opened up another whole can of worms. Only a few days after the Kecksburg incident occurred, WHJB News Director John Murphy, along with other members of the news staff, collected information for a radio documentary on the incident called Object in the Woods. We received other calls early tonight from some other people who said they had changed their minds now, at the last minute, and did not want the statements they had made over this past weekend used on this radio program tonight. One person said that they were afraid of the state police, and another person said they did not want to get in trouble with the Army. We will present a cut and edited version of the radio program Objects in the Woods. We regret that part of the program had to be censored, and other parts of the program had to be cut out entirely. Murphy had indicated on his broadcast that no political or other influences concerning this program had occurred, Yet some people who were close to him remembered events which could suggest otherwise. Bonnie Millslagel was the wife of John Murphy at the time of the occurrence. He was annoyed. He had already gotten this all done and he had to turn around and change a lot of it, which took more time. And he didn't really like having to do that, you know, since he had his story all done. And it was a good story. He was starting not to talk a whole lot about what was going on with the specifics of it. Uh, people evidently seemed afraid for some reason, and he wanted to get this story out. Um, a week or two after that, after they uh, had censored, or the, the program had to be so censored, that uh, he clammed up all of a sudden himself. Wouldn't talk about it. Nothing. I saw nothing about the story around the house. Usually he has papers and stuff, you know. I didn't see anything laying loose in the car. So it just, like it never happened. 
somebody had to have gotten about, gotten to him because it was very unlike John to just drop something. I mean, this is like the story of his lifetime. I mean, it's the way he treated it. It was a good story, and he had so much there. I mean, he was right there on the scene, uh, spoke to numerous people. Everybody had seen this, that, or another, whatever their particular story was. And all of a sudden, nothing, not a word. It was totally unlike him to drop something like that. Linda Fosha was the continuity director at WHJB Radio in Greensburg when the incident occurred. I remember quite a bit of activity. I remember a lot of interviews being taken by people that had seen the object. I remember John being really excited about the program he was preparing. Uh, he had everything ready to go for broadcast. However, a few days later, I'm not sure of the exact time on that, but I remember men coming in wanting to talk to John. And uh, he, I know he was highly upset at the time these men come in. I do remember, he was real agitated. And I remember uh, after they had left, that he had said they had taken what he had had uh, taped. And he was quite upset because he had spent a lot of time and he had known what he had seen and, and there was too many people that had come forward at the time. And he just was really agitated. Regarding the Kecksburg incident and the tapes that John had prepared and the program he wanted to present on the air, he was really gung-ho at the time on it, and he was very excited about how it had turned out. And after three or four weeks, he just kind of turned silent on the subject. He really did not want to discuss it with anyone, and he just would change the subject uh, fast. It, w it wasn't that he was scared, it's just that he did not want to say anything further on the subject. Did Murphy himself see something that day that he never revealed? And did he have evidence of the event that he also never made public for some reason? So when he got out there, he started phoning me or calling me on the CB and uh, giving me information to call back, which I did. Uh, he told me that something had landed in the woods. He didn't know what, but he was going down there. And there were were people starting to mill around and, and people that were getting there from it. So I waited and he called me back. And uh, he said it had landed down in the woods. It was partially buried, had some funny kind of writing on it, something like Egyptian writing, hieroglyphics. And uh, when he came back up, uh, at some point there, military had come in, the state police were there, uh, he couldn't get back down, they took the film out of his camera, but I believe he still had some in his pocket that they didn't get, they didn't find. Uh, he had his tape recorder with him, he always took notes, so he had his notepad, and I saw the notes. I know John had pictures of the object. He told me he did. He wouldn't lie about that. It's too good a story to pass up. While traveling out of state several years after the Kecksburg incident, John Murphy was killed in a tragic hit-and-run accident. I was shocked when I heard the news of his untimely death. It was only a few weeks before that John had sent me the original uncut reel-to-reel -reel master of the radio documentary for me to copy for research purposes. My copy of that tape has mysteriously disappeared. While there is no evidence that would relate Murphy's tragic accident to the Kecksburg incident, his former wife feels that his death was suspicious. Got in California, Santa Barbara area, and as I was told, as I read on the police report, he was looking at, or crossing the road, to look at the oil slicks up in Santa Barbara. 
at 10 o'clock at night. He was crossing a road, and a VW had come around, come down the road, 60 plus miles an hour, hit him. Well, along with the police report, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. And finding out things and looking back in, in retrospect, uh, the whole thing didn't make sense. It's like, somebody want to shut him up? You know, I've wondered this for years because the whole thing didn't make any sense. Why would he cross a road at 10 o'clock at night to see an oil slick? Late Carl Metz was a state police fire marshal and he was well respected in the Greensburg community. Over the years, Metz was approached by various people, some of whom he had known well, asking about his involvement with the Kecksburg incident, but he indicated that he could not talk about it. Bob Kovaleski was a former Pennsylvania State Trooper who spoke with Carl Metz shortly after the incident occurred. Well, at the time of the Kecksburg incident, uh, I was a trooper with the Pennsylvania State Police, and I was uh, doing some investigations down in the Philadelphia area. Uh, but I did live in Greensburg at that time and was commuting back and forth on weekends. And uh, I heard about the Kecksburg incident through the media in Philadelphia, and I was curious about it. And uh, one weekend when I was home, I ran into uh, Trooper Carl Metz, who was the uh, fire marshal for the state police in our area. And uh, I asked Carl if he heard anything about it, and he said that he was at the scene the night that it happened. And he said that he was sworn to secrecy by an army officer that was uh, at the scene that evening, and he couldn't discuss it any further. So I respected his decision on that and changed the subject. And that's all I know about the Kecksburg incident, other than what I read in the paper and heard on the street. It was about 20 years after the incident that Carl Metz reportedly discussed with a group of police officers at Greensburg City Hall that he had been at the Kecksburg crash site and he had seen something unlike anything he had ever encountered before. Howard Burns was a dispatcher for the City of Greensburg Police Department when this conversation occurred. I was working as a dispatcher in the Greensburg Police Station. This was in the early 1980s when they some of the, the, the policemen that were on duty were coming in at change of shift and that, and we were sitting there discussing strange events that various ones had seen and so forth. And Carl Metz was there, and he had said that he was one of the first troopers to arrive on the scene at Kecksburg, and that he had gone down to the area where the uh, object had impacted and that he uh, believed from what he had seen that it, at first that it was a uh, air, aircraft crash site because it can knock several trees over and it impacted into the ground but when he came across the object partially buried in the ground he could see that it was no no object that like anything that he had ever seen before and that while he was there he uh, several military personnel arrived they ordered everyone out of the area including him and they also ordered him never to discuss this with anyone of what he had seen that night there at Kecksburg. I don't know why Carl decided to discuss it at that particular time although from his discussion and from what he said that evening, he was not revealing everything that he knew or had seen at that location when he was there. He was still maintaining a certain amount of secrecy as far as a lot of the details of what he had seen. All he, was, all he would say was that he was there, he had seen the object, that it wasn't anything like anything that he had ever seen before, but he wouldn't go in, he wouldn't elaborate on what what it was or what it might have been. He literally said he he just said he you know he he had been told never to discuss it and that he you know wasn't going to discuss it any further. I knew Carl Metz for uh, oh a good eight years, 
and I always respected him highly as all the other guys did on the state police force. He was a top-notch investigator, very honest, certainly a very credible person. Uh, so I, I would 100% uh, believe any statement that Carl made to me. I'd have no reason ever to doubt anything. He was a very serious person uh, and very uh, well thought of uh, statewide on the Pennsylvania State Police Force. Carl Metz was a very respected man in this entire area and he valued his integrity very much. He was, a lot of people really respected him because of the fact that he was a very honest and very had, highly intelligent and in, had a lot of integrity in both his personal and professional career. If an object was recovered, do official reports exist that the public has not seen? In 1990, Clifford Stone retired from the United States Army. He is now active in UFO research. Stone and another former military officer who are unknown to each other both state that they have seen an official report on the recovery of the object from Kecksburg. No such documents have ever surfaced for public scrutiny. While I was in the military, I got to see a document. The document talks about uh, a recovery uh, in uh, the Pennsylvania area, and I think it refers to Acme, Pennsylvania. It makes, in that document, it makes it quite clear we recovered uh, an object, that the object, in fact, uh, was not Soviet. And it also makes it quite clear that the object did not originate on the face of the earth. That on the night of December 9, 1965, something entered the earth's atmosphere. Something went down in Pennsylvania. Something was recovered by the military. And Whatever that something is, is considered by the United States intelligence community to be so sensitive that they will even lie to members of Congress to keep that information highly classified and buried away from the public. Over the years, there have been many explanations for the Kecksburg object, including the crash of a spy plane, an expelled Gemini capsule, a Nike missile fired in air, and a projectile shot from a giant gun on a railroad car in Canada. None of these explanations seems to fit with the information at hand. And of course we have the meteor explanation. The following eyewitness accounts suggest that this was not just space junk burning up, but appears to have been a device which had some form of guidance control capability. Well, it was flying at a very slow speed. It made a, a deep hissing noise. It didn't seem to speed up or slow down. It just maintained a steady speed as it flew over us. I see this object coming down from, like it's coming from Laurelville into Kecksburg. And uh, it was like a fireball with this uh, different color streamers coming from it, like a, like a vapor. And uh, it wasn't going fast, like as if it was coming down and was out of control and was going to crash. This was just more like a uh, moderate type speed. And it, you could tell by watching it, the way as it descended, that it was being controlled. Lewis Winkler has been a professor at Penn State University in the Department of Astronomy for over 31 years. The distinction uh, among the terms meteor, meteoroid, and meteorite uh, an object in space, whether it be stone or metal, or a mixture, is called a meteoroid. As it enters uh, Earth's atmosphere and excites the uh, atoms in the atmosphere and is luminous, it's a mete meteor. And uh, if it survives the flight, doesn't burn up, it becomes a meteorite. Uh, an especially bright meteor is a fireball. Uh, the Kecksburg object did occur during the meteor uh, shower of the Geminids, but uh, the uh, showers are, are almost never 
uh, accompanied by a fall of an object. If a fall does occur, to, uh, like from an asteroid, it's uh, only coincidental in, in timing, and uh, these things are sporadic, whereas uh, meteor showers are uh, annual things that occur uh, at the same time each year. The data which points to the, the fact that it's not a, a natural phenomenon is the very slow speed that it had uh, during the uh, last part of its trajectory and uh, the size of the object being far greater than anything uh, uh, you would ever expect to recover without a, a crater and the fact that it was hauled out by a flatbed truck if anything that size if it were stone or iron uh, would not uh, be transportable by the truck the military responding to uh, a meteor uh, is uh, most unusual I, I can't think of any uh, other uh, meteors where, where that kind of response uh, occurred. For many years, the most likely answer for the Kecksburg object was a Soviet Venus space probe designated as Cosmos 96. The U.S. Space Command records indicate that the probe re-entered the Earth's atmosphere on the same date as the incident, but at about 3.18 a.m. in Canada. The Naval Space Surveillance Center database also confirms Cosmos 96 decaying on that day. The Cosmos series satellite does have some similarities to what witnesses say the object looked like at Kecksburg. In June of 1995, I received a direct response from the Russian Space Agency concerning Cosmos 96. While I had asked many specific questions about the probe which went unanswered, the letter did state, Unfortunately, we were unable to spot direct correlation between flight of satellite Cosmos 96 and incident in town of Kecksburg. If indeed a Soviet device had fallen at Kecksburg, it was the obligation of the United States under the United Nations resolution to return the recovered space object to that country. Clifford Stone, after having met with visitors from the Soviet Union interested in UFO matters, heard another possible explanation for what occurred. They immediately stated that from sources with inside their own government involved in UFO investigations, that they were informed that uh, Cosmos 96 had collided with an object of unknown origin that came from out in space, collided with it, and caused it to veer off and plunge back to Earth. They're sure of the location that Cosmos 96 went down, but that they didn't have the evidence, but they were sure that another object, the one that collided with it, also crashed back into the Earth. And they were sure that whatever happened at Kecksburg was possibly linked to that object if it wasn't the object. There is a wide range of ideas of what people think it was that landed at Kecksburg. I personally think that the probe that maybe fell near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania in 1965 was a terrestrial probe. I think that the object looked like an acorn-shaped object with, an, with a rim around it, with the hydrographic drawings. I think it re looked remarkably similar to a Soviet spacecraft that was used at that time. Cosmos 96 is what I'm thinking of in particular, and according to records, a craft of that, of that type came down approximately at the time that the Kecksburg crash happened. To this day, 30 years later, I still don't know what the object was. My own personal feeling was that I stumbled upon an interplanetary spaceship of some caliber. My general consensus is that something happened. I think that there was an object that fell to the ground. I don't know what that object was. I suspect that it was probably some kind of uh, small missile that, uh, that came to the ground. It was probably a mistake. To me, it, uh, it looked like it was from outer space. I mean, uh, another country or something like that. I mean. Uh, who controlled it? How did it get in there so easy? I mean, how did it, it didn't go down and dig a big hole? It came in just like if it was controlled. Somebody had control of it. Now, you know, it, 
and it was all it was all one piece. There was no windows, no well mark, or no, no nothing, no no rivets, no nothing. It was just one solid piece. I have never seen anything that looked like what I saw that night because I had such a distinct view of it. Uh, to this day, I can picture it in my mind just the way it was that day. It made an impression. A lot of people feel the same as I do. It was a Russian uh, rocket or satellite, that type of thing. You know, uh, there, if you read the newspapers at the time, listened to television at the time, uh, the United States was putting up some, trying to put up some spaceships or whatever you want to call them, rockets, same way with the Russians. During my interview with Myron, he disclosed a shocking detail. He revealed that he saw what appeared to have been a body in the building with the object. When I walked in the building and seen the bell shape there and they was working on it, I also seen an object laying on the workbench over there and the workbench runs about 10 to 12 feet long and about 32 inches wide and about four or three foot, about 36 inches off the floor. I seen the left hand of ever what was in there sticking out underneath of the sterile white pad and he only had three fingers it was about four foot nine or or four foot five inches tall if it was standing up but it looked like it weighed about 80 pounds and it had dark green or brownish skin and it was just like a lizard i have no doubt in my mind that the body laid on that table and uh, the left hand of him was sticking out underneath of the white uh, sterile pad that they had placed over him. And he had the three index finger and his skin looked like lizard. I asked Myron why he waited so many years to divulge what he had seen in 1965. Well, for the reason I never said anything before, because Uncle Sam said if, if it were ever leaked out and they had to come and, and lock you up and throw the keys away or give you a bullet to satisfy you, no one will ever talk about it. Right now is the time to tell it before something drastic happens. And my son, he's 24 years old, and he said, why are you going to do it now? And I said, well, I may not live till tomorrow or the next day to tell it, so I'll tell it all tonight and be done with it. The only thing I've got now is a bad heart and high blood pressure and sugar and on oxygen once in a while and, and walking around taking nitroglycerin. And the only reason I'm telling you now is because I may not be here tomorrow. If Myron's statement of having seen a body is true, this brings up many more questions as to what the object was. Was this a visitor from another world? Or could this have been a crew member of a space device launched from Earth? Could there have been some type of accident where the occupant was exposed to radiation or high heat that could have distorted its physical appearance? The witnesses of the Kecksburg incident stand by their accounts and they want to know what really happened. Well, they can believe what they want to. I know what I've seen, and I know what happened, because the military was in my house, along with a lot of other ones. I'd be willing to, yes, to testify under oath what I saw that night, the military being there, and I would testify. Well, no matter what all has been said about this, I know what I saw and can still remember it as it happened the day I saw it and I would be willing to testify under oath as to what I saw. I'm willing to take a polygraph test or whatever they want me to do to, to show that I'm, I'm telling the truth of what I've seen. I'd be interested in going to a grand jury and tell them just what I've seen. If an object did fall at Kecksburg, was it a man-made space vehicle that had certain maneuverable capabilities or could this have been a visitor from another world whose spacecraft had propulsion methods that exceeded the technical understanding of mankind yet somehow went astray? Or was this indeed just a hoax? Was our government testing a new space device that failed? Or did we possibly recover a sophisticated Soviet space vehicle that we wanted to study and never returned? And what if we did indeed recover a spacecraft from another world? Shouldn't we have the right to know the truth? Besides the Kecksburg incident, there are other alleged crashes of unusual aerial devices which have reportedly fallen around the world. 
While it is likely that most of these are man-made space vehicles that have survived re-entry, what if some were extraterrestrial spacecraft? Is it possible that some of our technical advancements have been obtained from the study of materials that have been recovered from these alien craft? I hope this presentation has given you some insight into the Kecksburg event. Many questions about the incident still remain unanswered. It's up to you to decide. The Kecksburg incident, hoax or reality? a couple miles away and we're able to watch it approach us, fly over us and fly away from us. So it wasn't moving very fast at all. Well, I know what I saw and it definitely wasn't a meteor. I really can't explain what it is, what it was, but it certainly seemed to be a constructed thing. You know, it, it uh, had smooth edges and smooth lines and didn't appear to be a meteor at all to me. Bill Bullybush was working outside on the CB radio in his car when he saw the object. I was out here working on my Corvair. I was putting a, a CB radio in it. Well, it was in it, but I was trying to get more par out of it, see where I could go with it, and who I could get with it. And I happened to look up in the air, and I, I was down, down under the, like the dash, and I could see this. But I was looking up. And I seen this blue, like a bluish fireball or whatever you call it, up in the sky coming from Norvelt and going towards Lorville, towards the mountain. And uh, I thought, uh-oh. So I went out on the road and I watched it. You could see it. And it just seemed like if it uh, wanted to go over the mountain and it couldn't go over the mountain. It just seemed like it hesitated. And then finally it came back and made a U-turn and went down into Kecksburg. Other witnesses saw the object ascend as well. After it fell, a blue column of smoke was seen rising from the area, but it quickly dissipated. It was at WHJB Radio in Greensburg, the county's first commercial radio station, where the station's news and office staff was overwhelmed with phone calls from residents who reported seeing the brilliant object. The late John Murphy was the news director of WHJB Radio at the time of the incident. As the story broke, he began to document the information. The control tower at the Greater Pittsburgh Airport definitely confirmed the fact 
that there was an object in the sky at that time, 13 minutes before 5. Mabel Mazza, former office manager of WHJB Radio, recalls the event of that day. I, I was employed at WHJB Radio in Greensburg. At this particular time, um, I was in the capacity of bookkeeper and office manager. Um, for some reason or other, I stayed over that evening um, at the radio station, and there was a number of calls started to come in about 5, 5.30, somewhere around there, concerning a sighting of a saucer or a UFO or some kind of an unidentified object in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. Um, as time went on, the calls became more frequent and more steady. We received a lot of calls from uh, a number of radio stations and TV stations. Uh, of course, at first I thought, you know, these are just a bunch of people, you know, playing pranks. Well, as the uh, evening went on, I realized something definitely had, or did happen. And um, they were serious and they were excited and there was full of emotion. After 6.30 p.m., the radio station received a call that earlier something had fallen from the sky into the nearby Kecksburg woods. John Murphy notified the state police at Greensburg, then drove to the Kecksburg site. He was at the scene at about 7.20 p.m. and was there for almost an hour when Carl Metz, the state police fire marshal, and a thing fell from the sky that day that the story is only a hoax. What is clear is that many witnesses tell similar accounts about what they experienced on that December day in 1965. Hello, my name is Stan Gordon. In 1959, I began an interest in reports of UFO sightings and the unexplained. Since that time, I have investigated thousands of UFO sightings and other unusual occurrences from across Pennsylvania. When I was 16, an event occurred not far from my hometown of Greensburg, Pennsylvania that created both local and national interest, the incident upon which this presentation is focused. This documentary will provide an avenue expression for some of those involved with the Kecksburg event so they may share the story. We will focus on the local activity associated with the case as related by area residents as well as persons from the news media, law enforcement and medical community who will share their experiences associated with the case. This documentary includes eyewitness testimony, some of which being revealed for the first time. Late on the afternoon of December 9, 1965, numerous witnesses from Canada and the Northeast United States observed a brilliant fireball moving rapidly across the sky. Sightings of a fireball reported over the Pittsburgh and Greensburg, Pennsylvania area as well. The object made a turn between Greensburg and Latrobe and was reported from local communities as it moved towards the south. Near Laurelville, the object turned again and began to track northeast towards the Kecksburg area where it reportedly impacted into the woods. Those who saw the object passing through the sky shortly before it fell believed that what they saw was not a meteor. Near Norvell, two young boys were playing outside when their attention was attracted upwards by an unusual sound. One of these boys was Randy Overly, who recalls what he saw that Thursday afternoon. I was approximately 10 years old. I was playing with another friend of mine out in the middle of an open field by a creek and uh, I heard a noise and looked to the, I believe it was northwest and uh, we saw an object coming at us. We could see it a pretty good distance away. We watched it come fly over top of us and leave our vision. Um, the object was sort of acorn shaped. It had a raised area around the back. It was a brownish grayish color. There was fire coming out of the back of it. It had a rounded part on the very tip of it. It also seemed to be covered with some type of vapor wrapped around it as it flew over. It made a hissing noise. Uh, it was probably only 200 feet in the air when we saw it. And we saw it for a, 
you know, for a good distance coming at us. It had a reddish, yellowish flame, and it also had gr a greenish color in the flames. When it passed over us, it was probably only 200 feet in the air at the most, and it was moving no faster than a small aircraft. Um, in fact, we saw it from a good piece away, probably. On December 9, 1965, near the village of Kecksburg, Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, witnesses describe an unusual object which fell from the sky into a wooded area. According to many accounts, within hours after the object had fallen, military equipment and personnel began to descend on this normally quiet rural community. Later that evening, a military flatbed tractor trailer truck was seen carrying an unusual shaped object away from the area. Some local residents claim that nothing